Welcome, welcome everyone. We're just waiting for the room to get populated with the other participants and then um, we'll be starting at about 10. Ambassador Varga, thank you for joining us. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Ambassador Varga. Good morning, it's Dr. Guy. Ah, Dr. Guy. Very good. Um, so Dr. Guy, you want me to say a few words before we start? Yes, yeah, so I will introduce you, welcome everybody and introduce you, and you would start and then we'll kick off the program. Very good, very good. Okay. So in November, we have four lectures. Yes. And later on, we have four other lectures, I think. Yes, four, no, three. Three in December three. and three in January. Because of the holidays. Ah, yes, yes. So three in, the, uh, three in December and... Three in January, yes. And so altogether 10, 10 lectures. Yes, 10 in all, a series of 10 series, yes. Great, yeah. I'm really excited. It's good, good to start this. Nevis, how are you doing? Hello? Okay, I'm not hearing you. Yeah, sorry, yes. Okay, I'm off the mute now. How are you doing? I am well, I am well, and how are you? Nice to been, see you. Oh, thanks been, for the support. It's Thank been a long time since I see you so long. I've been looking for you. <laughs> It's been two years and three years since I'm looking for you. Okay. You don't even know why, but it was true. Your good, the deeds of your good sister and yourself. You must have heard about it. Oh yes, we live. We live. Just reminded you guys that we live. For everyone that's just coming in, um, we're just waiting for the majority of the participants to come in before we begin the proceedings this morning. So bear with us for a couple of minutes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so in the essence of time, just a little um, housekeeping. For those who don't know, I'm Ashley Morris, Heritage Preservation and Research Officer at the National Trust. And um, for the proceedings this morning, we just would like the participants to know that um, we would have the mics muted, your mics will be muted. And after the proceedings, we will have, after the lecture, we will have a question and answer segment. So, if you have any burning questions, you want to just jot down, you could jot down those questions in the chat and we'll be looking at the chat to, to pull out those questions. Ashley, am I on cameras yet? Yes, you are. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you can hear me loud and clear, Ashley? Yes, I can, definitely. Thank you.
Okay, so it's 10 o'clock and we have um, just over 60 participants in. So Dr. Guy, I think we could start now if there are no objections. Good morning, good afternoon to our audience in the Netherlands and welcome. I am Dr. Levis Guy Obiakwa, the director of the Scarborough Harbor Project 1677 Rockley Bay Research in Tobago. The Scarborough Harbor Project 1677 Rockley Bay Research is pleased to partner with the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Port of Spain, Trinidad to execute this lecture series titled From the City of Vlissinger to New Walcheren, the mean? Dutch in the West Indies. Excellency, thank you for your insight and your invitation to partner with us at the Scarborough Harbor Project. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce His Excellency Rafael Varga, Ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Port of Spain to give his remarks. Ambassador. Good morning, good afternoon in the Netherlands. Dear all, I'm happy to open this virtual series of lectures titled From Vlissingen to Nieuw Walcheren that dives into the history of the Dutch presence in Tobago and the West Indies. This whole idea has been organized on the initiative of the Scarborough Harbor Project and the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Port of Spain was happy to support. A warm welcome to all of you. In the Netherlands, this part of the national history may be a bit forgotten. Here in the Caribbean region, there is ample information available as experts have been doing research on different aspects of the presence of the Dutch. And we are lucky because in the upcoming weeks, we can follow virtually 10 distinguished speakers who will focus from different angles and touch upon different aspects of the history of the Dutch presence in Tobago and the West Indies. Tobago changed hands many times in the past. The brief period of the Dutch presence in the 17th century is not very visible anymore, though sugar mills, Dutch Fort Road and Jan de Moor Road in Puko are still to be found. And the names New Flissingen and New Walcheren in uh, Tobago suggest these colonists originated mainly from the province of Zeeland, Zeeland. In the Netherlands, in the town called Flissingen, one will find the Tobago Avenue. I'm excited and curious what these lectures will bring. Today, we will start with the findings of Professor Bachvarov, who with his team did ample underwater research in the harbor of Scarborough, where the Dutch and French shipwrecks can be found that sunk during the horrendous battles of Tobago between the French and the Dutch in March and December 1677. A couple of years ago, a 19 minute doku drama called Tobago, Tobago 1677, based on these events was realized, was released. If you're interested, the movie is available on internet. And with this, dear mod moderator, Dr. Guy Obiakor, I will give the floor back to you uh, to introduce Professor Dr. Bachvarov from the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you, Excellency. I would now invite our Chief Secretary and the Secretary of Tourism, Culture and Transportation, the Honorable Ansel Dennis, to bring his remarks on behalf of the Tobago House of Assembly. There is a dominant feeling as I greet you all here today, and that is a feeling of immense gratitude. I am truly thankful that many of you involved in this virtual lecture series have served and continue to serve as important forces in preserving this island's unique history. By doing so with the tools of history and archaeology, you have provided us as Tobagonians with a prism that allows us to piece together our existence and deeply meet ourselves. 
It is, therefore, an honor to be a part of this distinguished occasion and extend warm greetings on behalf of the Tobago House of Assembly and the Division of Tourism, Culture and Transportation. As a people, there is a need for us to delve deeper into the Dutch aspect of our island's history and events such as today propel us closer to that crucial level of self-awareness. With the recent return of the KLM Royal Dutch Airlines to Trinidad and Tobago, another door has opened for us to learn and deepen our understanding of one another. Truly, history connects this world together unlike any other, reminding us that we are part of each other's stories. It may lead to moments that are painful, but we are always more powerful when we hold an appreciation for our past. The Dutch presence, legacy, and impact on history, culture, trade, and the commerce between the Netherlands and the Caribbean is beyond remarkable. And I am pleased that we continue to keep this bond between us alive. So, I want to take this opportunity to extend my appreciation to the Ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, His Excellency Raphael Varga van Kiebet, and his staff for their contribution towards this important venture. I also want to welcome the local and international academics, municipalities, libraries, educational institutions, and the local historical societies who are included in this experience. Let me specifically commend the Ministry of Culture in the Netherlands, the lecturers from the University of Leiden, the University of Amsterdam, and the Philipsburg Jubilee Library in St. Martin. On the local front, I extend my regards to the National Historic Trust, Angelo Bicessa Singh Virtual Museum, the Tobago Heritage Conservation Society, and the Tobago Library Services. Special commendations also go out to the Scarborough Harbor Project, led by Dr. Levis Guy Obiako, for their commitment to this lecture series. I pray that the next few days will be an enlightening and enjoyable experience for all in attendance. Do know that Tobago sincerely thanks you, and I thank you as well for your tireless efforts. Welcome, welcome again. And now I would read the biography of Professor Kum Bachvarov, who has been a colleague and a tireless worker in the service of preserving the culture and history of our little island, Tobago. Dr. Kum Bachvarov is an associate professor of maritime archeology span at the University of Connecticut. His main research focus is in the archeology span of 17th century seafaring. He specializes in English, Dutch, and Ottoman ship construction. While employed, by the Swedish National Maritime Museums, the division of the Vasa, he developed and implemented a method for recording the frames of the Swedish warship Vasa of 1628. Professor Bachvarov recently used the same method in the recording of the framing of the English ship Warwick, which was lost in Bermuda in 1619. Between 2000 and 2001, he organized and excavated and directed also a complete excavation of a black ship sea, a black sea ship, shipwreck, I'm sorry, in the southern bay of Kitten, Bulgaria. Between 2012 and 2016, he directed the Rockley Bay Research Project studying the archaeological remains of a 1677 French-Dutch naval battle in Tobago. Recently, Professor Bachvarov is co-directing a Black Sea maritime archaeological project. 
the largest maritime archaeological project ever undertaken. And he's also the co-lead in the excavations of a submerged early Bronze Age settlement in the Black Sea. Currently, he's studying for the publication of 38 shipwrecks found in the Black Sea from the Ottoman period and one in the Byzantine wreck dated in the beginning of the 10th century AD. I am pleased to welcome Professor Bachvarov, a friend of Tobago, a friend of the Caribbean, who has made a significant contribution again to a Dutch legacy in Tobago. Professor Bachvarov. Your Excellency, Dr. Guy Obiakur, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this opportunity to say a couple of words before the recorded lecture uh, plays. This was a truly interesting project. I have been fascinated with Dutch 17th century seafaring and shipbuilding for decades, and I have done a certain amount of research in that uh, sphere, even if lately most of my work has been in the Black Sea. It's like a black hole always drags you back there. But my heart remains in uh, Rockley Bay, and specifically the wreck that we will be discussing that may very well be the remains of Helste Kroeningen, one of the Dutch most famous warships of the 17th century. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Tobagonian government, the House of Assembly, the Right Honorable Secretary, and uh, the Tobago Historical Trust for their, well, this is going to ho sound horrible, but uh, horrible tautology, but to thank them for their trust in us and in the project, for their support. I would like to thank also our colleague and friend Derek Chung, who was an important member of the expedition, other supporters like Mr. Kevin Kenny, and of course, first and foremost, I would like also to thank the Dutch embassy who have always been a mountain of support to the project and encouragement. I mentioned it briefly in the lecture, but these are the final words that I will say before uh, we continue this. I believe that the history of Dutch seafaring in the 17th century, their ability to build the largest and most powerful maritime uh, infrastructure in the world is a wonderful example for countries nowadays that uh, may lack some of the resources that one would like to have. The Dutch created the best shipbuilding in the world, the most powerful maritime empire of trade and uh, naval action, entirely lacking the basic resources needed for such a thing. There are virtually no forests. All the timber for Dutch shipbuilding was imported. Everything was thanks to organization and determination on the part of people who participated in that industry. And I believe that this is really the morale of the story. This is what makes it important to continue studying the past and understand it better. That pretty much if you're determined to do something, you can regardless of the resources. Once again, thank you ever so much for your presence. Thank you ever so much for all the support. And, uh, Back to Dr. Guy Obiakor with my gratitude to her. Project that we undertook in Scarborough Harbor. It is, or at the time it was, Possibly the largest naval battle carried out in Caribbean waters. And it would remain so until pretty much the war of American independence in the later 18th century. The sheer loss of life, the sheer loss of uh, ships is uh, staggering. And I may jump the gun a little bit by pointing out that the significant numbers of them were accidental losses rather than truly intended. First of all, let me point out that Tobago has the questionable distinction of having changed hands around 20 to 27 times in its history. 
from the native Carib populations through the different European nations that attempted to control the island all the way to the present Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Why such great interest in the island is a logical question. If you look at the map of the Caribbean area, you will see that Tobago shares one characteristic with the island of Barbados. It is out of the way. And in the context of 17th century naval strategy, this was of very great importance. It meant practically that a fleet arriving from Europe could make it to the island without being noticed without anyone else in the Caribbean Basin being the wiser. All other islands are very nearly within sight of each other. And any large squadron that attempts to get uh, to them would be noticed and would be reported quickly. And of course, one of the main uh, objectives of any strategic campaign is to surprise the enemy. Thus, the island became especially important for the Dutch and the Spanish during the early part of the 17th century. The Netherlands were, or rather the present day kingdom of the Netherlands, its descendants were the Republic of the Seven United Provinces. And the seven provinces were engaged in an eight year war uh, for independence from Spain. As part of that were created a number of uh, semi-private stock companies that carried the war to the enemy. The one, of course, is the very well-known East Indies Company, but uh, in the 17th century of nearly equal importance was the West Indies Company. And that company was established specifically to colonize the Caribbean, to establish bases for the Dutch in the Caribbean, and also to actively fight uh, the Spaniards. And obviously, to preferably gain loot for the benefit of the investors. From this point of view, Tobago was a very important and interesting location. Any fleet arriving from Europe in this period would have needed to clean the holes from growth in order to restore their uh, speed and also their maneuverability, their ability to gain ground to windward. It needed to refresh the people after the long voyage across the Atlantic. It needed to, to re-rig the vessels and prepare them for campaigning in the Caribbean area. From that point of view, Tobago was an ideal place. Hence, of course, the interest in the, of the Dutch in it. I should point out that the Dutch were not the only ones interested in the island. The Spanish Empire had pretty much given up on the smaller Antilles and the smaller islands in the region for the very simple reason that they lacked the manpower to occupy every possible piece of land in the Caribbean. By this stage, most of the islands had been abandoned by the Spaniards. They had withdrawn to the mainland and kept the larger of the Antilles. But the rest had become open ground for French, Dutch, English and other you can call them either pioneers, buccaneers, or uh, just uh, entrepreneurs. Choose your name for that. A particular activity, of course, were the Dutch and the English. And most of the rest of the story of the island is connected with the Dutch. I should point out that uh, King James I also chose to grant the island of Tobago to his favorites. He had about as much right to do so, since he had not occupied the island or claimed it, as I do of promising Sweden to somebody. But that didn't stop King James I. At the same time, Tobago has the distinction of being the only colony that the Principality of uh, present-day Latvia known at the time as Principality of Kurland, ever established. That is exactly why there are small and large Kurland bays on the northwestern side of the island. That colony was entirely the brainchild of uh, the Prince of Kurland, 
Um, fortunately, he fell on the bad side of the Swedes. And in the 17th century, that was not a smart thing to do, them being the foremost military power in Europe. So for the next 10 years, he was on permanent vacation in Stockholm as a guest of the Swedish taxpayer, much against his desires, I should point out. But the result was that since Kurland did not really have economic interests in uh, the Caribbean and was a tiny state, this meant that practically their colony collapsed. They were lacking supplies, no communication with uh, the mother country, and they were surrounded by two Dutch colonies on both sides. Eventually, the Dutch made them a very smart offer. You either join us and recognize the superior, the overall control of the land uh, of the states of the Netherlands, or we simply take your colony. If you agree to our conditions, then we can resupply you, which you cannot do on your own, and you continue your work, but under the auspices of the proprietors of the island. The Kurlanders made pretty much the only possible choice in that. Agreed, of course. One unexpected and sometimes for most people surprising uh, challenge that the colonists in the 17th century encountered were the Caribbean Indians. The island of Tobago was regularly attacked by the Caribs from St. Vincent and also from what is today Venezuela. Both places can are within easy reach of dugout canoes and they proved to be even more dangerous than the Europeans to the colonists. Practically throughout the 17th century, Tobago never became a productive colony. Which did not stop Europeans fighting over it. And today we will be talking about some of the remains of uh, the best known of the battles in Tobago. It has even been the subject of a documentary or docudrama, perhaps is a better uh, way of describing it. In 1673, as part of the Anglo-Dutch Wars, the Third Anglo-Dutch War, uh, British, I should say English in this time, Britain is after the unification with Scotland in 1707, so an English squadron attacked the island and destroyed the Dutch colonies. For the next three years, the island was pretty much abandoned because uh, the English had neither the ability nor the manpower, nor quite frankly, the interest at the time of occupying the island. By 1674, England was out of the war, but the war itself continued between France and the Netherlands and would continue all the way until 1678, when finally King Charles II of England forced King Louis XIV of France to the negotiation table and ended the war. The majority of the naval action, the majority of the war was played out in European waters, but destruction of each other's colonies was part of the strategy of the two main proponents. In this period, France was the undoubted military power, uh, military giant really, in Europe. At sea, the French Navy was just beginning to gain its uh, laurels. It had been subjected to a rapid expansion under uh, Monsieur Colbert, the first minister of King Louis XIV. But the foremost naval power in the world remained the Netherlands. This is quite remarkable on a number of grounds. And this is what I consider to be really the big morale of the story. The Netherlands had a grand total population of three million people, one and a half of which were within the province of Holland. The Netherlands in the 17th century, the so-called Golden Age of the Netherlands, is known as the foremost maritime power. Everybody was buying ships from the Dutch. They were building faster, they were building cheaper, they were building quite often better than the others. But the cost difference was incredible. They became the carriers of the world's merchandise. 
How did they achieve this? And this really is the morale of the story because the truth of the matter is that the Netherlands lacked pretty much every single one of the main resources that are needed in order to construct a powerful maritime state. They did not have major forests. They did not have major sources of iron. They did not have the manpower. They did not have materials for canvas and for rope. And yet they were the foremost builder. To put this into perspective, in 1664, it became clear for the Dutch that war with England is inevitable. The English merchants were really interested in it, hoping that this way they will destroy the Dutch carrying trade and will gain that trade and income for themselves. They were not successful, but that is a subject of a different conversation. As part of this problem, the English decided to build 10 new warships. Within months, it was clear that they don't have the resources to build 10. So they cut down the order to four warships. By the end of the war in 1667, only two of these ships had been launched and seen action. Compare this with the Dutch. In 1664, they ordered 25 major warships of 60 or more guns for the state's navy. They were building on order nine ships for the French Navy, who were allied to them at the time, though never participated in the battles. And in addition to this, they were building seven ships for uh, Venice. All of these were built within six months. By 1665, most of the 25 ships were already in action against the English. That is entirely thanks to superior organization and hard work. No resources were available. It was superior organization that did it. It had something to do also with the traditional shipbuilding method of the Dutch. And that was what started my interest in the Battle of Tobago in the first place, studying the Dutch shipbuilding, a particular passion of mine over the century. So, let us return to 1676. A French squadron had devastated a certain number of Dutch colonies. As a response to this, a Dutch squadron under the command of a gentleman by the name of Jacob Binks or Banks, he himself wrote it Banks, but most historians list him as Binks, so take your pick, was sent during the off-season of war in Europe, that is to say during the winter uh, season, was sent to the Caribbean to destroy French colonies and a secondary task to re-establish the Dutch colony in Tobago. I mentioned that the island had changed uh, hands on a number of occasions. From about 1654 until 1676, the Lampsens brothers of merchants from the province of Zeeland in the Netherlands held the rights to the island. In 76, they sold them to the states of Holland, who in turn appointed a gentleman by the name of Hendrik Karloff, supervisory establishment of the colony of Tobago. Karloff was a Swede, though possibly coming from the German uh, territories of Sweden. Be this as it may, he sailed with Jakub Banks. Without talking too long about the entire action, mostly Banks' raiding of the colonies was successful. It destroyed uh, French Guiana. It captured a few of the smaller French islands, but of course did not have the manpower to control any of them. The point was essentially a raiding expedition. Having accomplished his other tasks, Jakub Banks sailed to the island of Tobago. Unfortunately, whether by mistake, whether by intent, significant portion of his squadron separated from the main part of the squadron and returned to Europe instead of following Banks to Tobago. That will have a nasty repercussions into the future. 
By the later part of the year, by December of 1676, of course, the news had arrived in uh, Europe and Louis XIV wanted a punitive expedition to be sent against the Dutch islands and particularly for the purpose of capturing Curaçao. That expedition was entrusted to a gentleman by the name of Destre. Incidentally, the slide that I'm showing you at the moment is Jakub Banks' chart of the island of Tobago, prepared during his tenure on the island, where he very quickly realized that uh, Hendrik Karloff was not the man to establish a colony. He did not have the capabilities, he didn't know what he was doing. And Jakub Banks realized that if he was to fulfill the his orders of helping the colony set uh, up, he had to do it himself. They ended up in what is today Rockley Bay. At the time, it was also known as Red Rock Bay. He constructed, or rather began constructing a fort around which the future battle would uh, be fought. And at the time, he drew this island. So on the left, you have Commander Jakub Banks. This is a portrait that is held in the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. The gentleman was of great experience. He had commanded ships for at least 20 years up to this point. He had, he probably is best known among the English speaking world as the man who reoccupied New York and returned it briefly to Dutch rule in 1674, together with uh, Cornelis Evertsen, or Kees Evertsen. That, of course, didn't last long. The Dutch government was only too happy to return New York to the English in exchange for a peace treaty, valuing New York very lowly. 17th century standards evaluation would have confirmed their opinion that New York was of very little value. His opponent would become the Monsieur Le Comte d'Estrée, Vice Admiral of the French Navy. He had participated in the battles of the Third Anglo-Dutch War, where the opinion of Prince Rupert, the English Commander-in-Chief and Allied Supreme Commander, was that d'Estrée is either a fool, incompetent, or a traitor. Or a coward. The one thing that d'Estrée certainly was not is a coward. Everything else, I'll leave you to judge. Destre was appointed commander of the French squadron to enter the Caribbean for two good reasons. First of all, he was high-ranking enough officer to command such a squadron. Second, he was of high enough social status to be able to enforce his command on the other captains. Third, he was a cousin of King Louis, which certainly did not hurt him. And fourth, and really the decisive factor, he was a wealthy man. France was in dire economic straits and did not have sufficient money for the fleet since the effort was concentrated on the army. Monsieur Le Comte was capable of funding or up fronting up the cost of equipping the squadron and sending it to sea out of his own pocket, which he did. Once in the Caribbean, he very quickly found out where Banks and the Dutch squadron are. And instead of following his orders of conquering Curaçao or attempting to conquer Curaçao, he decided on a revenge expedition against Banks. In the middle of February, he had arrived in the island of Tobago and about two weeks of intermittent fighting on dry land took place. He did not dare to attack the Dutch squadron directly into Rockley Bay for reasons that we'll discuss in just a moment. He had vast superiority of numbers and force. This is incidentally Jakub Banks' sketch of what the fort was intended to look like once completed. It is lying now under the center of Scarborough Harbor. Unfortunately, Banks neither had the resources nor the time to complete the fort, nor did he have sufficient manpower. His grand total was something in the vicinity of 700 men, for all the ships this included the future colonists in Tobago. To compare this with the French, in addition to the ship's crews, the French had 1,500 infantry with them. That is to say at least three battalions. 
plus the Marines aboard the ships who were fully manned. By this stage, the Dutch squadron had been in the Caribbean, had fought a number of battles, had suffered a number of casualties from tropical sickness to which the Europeans are uh, subject, far more than native populations. And you can understand how undermanned and how weak the Dutch squadron actually was. This is a redrawing of the final battle on March 3rd, 1677, with the fort over here. One of the Dutch positions is right at the top where Fort King George is located nowadays. It was just a small breastwork. Another outpost was located over here. And these two, it took two weeks for the French to push the Dutch back from these outposts uh, to fall back on the fort, which, as I mentioned, was not actually completed. Right before the crucial battle, Banks sent a dispatch to his superiors at Curacao that eventually made it to Europe, in which he said that the way he perceives his orders, his task is to hold the island at any cost. And as long as he controls the land, the island, his task is fulfilled. Therefore, he believed that the key is keeping the fort. As he did not have sufficient manpower, he weakened his ships, he withdrew most of the crews of his ships to uh, strengthen the fort. As he concluded in his dispatch, only a crasp fool would attack me uh, from the sea. Why so? Well, the dominant winds in the area and the currents are pushing the squadron into the bay. The bay is rockly, that is why it is called Rockly Bay. This entire area over here is reefs and underwater rocks. So we have a very limited space in which sailing ships could maneuver. The Dutch were anchored in a line from the reefs all the way to the mainland of the island with their supply vessels hidden behind the main line. This looked like a formidable arrangement and kept the French away for quite a while. But as I mentioned, the ships were actually weakly manned. So entering the bay is no problem. With the wind behind your back, with the right tide, entering the bay is no problem. The problem is how can you withdraw if something goes wrong? You can't. That is why Binks, the supreme seaman, would have never carried out such an attack. The following morning, however, just such a crust fool attacked his line from the sea. The French, this is again being a sketch uh, in the state's archives of the Netherlands, divided his fleet into two columns that were to engage the Dutch. To a large extent, this was because of the lack of success on the part of the land forces. Despite their superiority of more than two to one, the French had barely made any progress in pushing the Dutch out of the way. So the final risk of the battle, the final attempt to conquer the island was a two-pronged attack. The French were supposed to attack the fort over land, while the French Navy was supposed to attack the Dutch squadron, preventing the Dutch from concentrating on either of the two targets. By this stage, the stray must have been aware that the Dutch are uh, infinitely weaker than his forces. Let's have a brief look at what these forces actually were. The Beschermen, sometimes in the archives you can see it listed as Beschermer, means defender or defense, was a 50 gun ship of the line and was the flagship. Instead of having more than 250, between 250 and 300 men, which would have been its proper crew, it had only 153 men. The second ship in the squadron was Provincie van Zeeland. This is the one ship that I have not been able to track through the record so far. It may very well have been a privately owned, man, uh, privately owned man of war because it does not show up in any of the official lists of the Admiralties of the Netherlands, and there were five of them. But she likely was the third largest ship in the squadron, as the armament points out. She had only 118 men. A ship of this size with 44 guns in the 17th century should have had about 250. 
Finally, here is Hilfsde Kroeningen, the largest of the Dutch ships in the battle. She was built in 1653. I'll return to her a little bit later in the lecture. I should point out that this is only one of the spellings of the name that I have seen in original documents. From uh, Kroeningen with C through K, varieties are plentiful, sometimes in the same source. She was ready to carry 56 guns, and again, she should have had something in the vicinity of 300 men instead of 128 that were actually aboard. All the rest of the vessels were small frigates, what the Dutch would have called yachts, and the English would have called, uh, called six straight uh, frigates. Some of them were veterans, as the Kroningham was built in 1653, Miss Herming was part of the expansion of the Navy in the early 60s. Papkensburg or Papensburg, I have seen both names used, and Leiden were uh, veterans of the New York campaign of two years before that. Overall, it is possible that the Dutch crews were more experienced than their French opponents, but they certainly were coming in inferior numbers. And finally, at the very bottom are the three supply vessels that the Dutch squadron had with them. Before the battle, since Banks expected the battle to be entirely carried on dry land, he had moved all the women, children and the slaves of the island on the Sfera Mundi because he believed that this would be the safest place for them during the battle. Tragically, that did not prove to be the case, as she burned during the battle with huge loss of life. Compare the Dutch strength with the squadron under Monsieur Jean Pond, Jean Destre. His flagship was Le Glorious, and uh, this was a French three-decker constructed earlier in the 60s. It was actually French built, despite the fact that significant numbers of the French ships were Dutch built. Uh, Precious, for example, was Dutch built. As you can see, I'm listing it both as 72 or 64 guns. The, in Dutch sources, she is listed as 72 gun ship, but the uh, French sources claim that she carried no more than 58 or 60 at the battle. The class, however, was intended to carry 64 guns. So take your pick. Very likely she actually carried 64 guns at the time of the battle. Followed by Le Fendant, Precious, Intrepide and Galant. All of these ships were larger more heavily armed than any of the Dutch vessels. The ships between Le Marquis and Laurier were also more heavily armed, meaning the artillery, the caliber of the artillery they carried was heavier than uh, that of the Dutch. And as you can see, all of them had larger crews. This is one of the contemporary depictions of the battle. The first such broad, it is a broadsheet and it exists in a black and white and in colored versions. As is typical for the 17th century, the drawing actually is compiling the entire battle or different aspects of the battle into one depiction. If we have to take a look at this, it, over here you see the French fleet already withdrawing at the end of the battle or what is remaining of the French fleet. Here you see one of the major conflagrations. This is the battle between the French flagship Le Glorieuse, here with the blue flags, and here you see the stern of Haus de Kroeningen. The French admiral attacked Haus de Kroeningen, believing her to be the flagship because she was the largest vessel of the fleet. The battle was intense. The French boarded and having superior numbers very quickly conquered the upper deck of the two-decker. And here stories begin to differ. What happened next? Rumer Flack, the commander of the ship, 
blew up the uh, the main deck of his, the upper deck of his vessel in order to destroy the French invaders. As a result of this, the ship caught fire. The fire transferred to the French flagship, and both vessels were consumed by the fire. Uh, Glorious exploded eventually. Helps the Kroningen drifted onto the reefs and in the shallow waters and continued burning there until it was completely destroyed. Why the differences of opinion? One is that Römer Flack intended to blow up the entire ship and thus destroy the French. The other one is that he intended to blow up only the upper deck, which was a recognized tactic for defeating boarding actions in the enemy when you are the inferior force. Here, to the starboard, this vessel with the command flag at the main mast is Beschermer or Beschermen. And over here is Wappen de Zeeland. These here are the three merchant ships. This is Sferamundi. Over here are the rest of the Dutch squadron, the majority of which, as you saw, already burned in the battle. The French really intended to burn Middelburg, but the fire spread throughout the entire Dutch line. One of the smaller frigates drifted into the merchant ships and burned them as well. So this loss over here was completely accidental and unintended by either side. At the end of the battle, by mid-afternoon, at the time when the tide began to change, the Dutch had taken care of the French attack, which is shown over here. They had managed to push the French back and the French had decided that they had enough of the battle and will wait and see what the fleet does in the battle. So the Dutch were able to transfer their attention and their cannon fire onto the French squadron. And up to that point, most of the battle was going in favor of the French, with the exception that they had lost their flagship, they had lost their second largest vessel in the battle run aground and captured by the Dutch. But by and large, the Dutch were losing more ships than the French. When the artillery turned on the French ship, that is when the disaster uh, struck. At the end of the day, it was the tide that saved the French and allowed their ships to drift out of range of the artillery. And over the next three days, the strain managed to withdraw the squadron, roughly repair it and return to France to report his uh, results. In the best traditions of naval history, both sides claimed victory. The Dutch on the grounds that they kept the island and after all, the whole point of the exercise was to control the island. The French claimed victory on the basis that they, that they had lost fewer ships than the Dutch. Of course, they did not mention that their ships had also been smaller, meaning the Dutch ships being smaller. The French struck a medallion, a medal for in honor of the battle and in honor of the Stray's so-called victory. By the end of the year, Monsieur de Stray was at the head of an even larger squadron of ships supported by a number of buccaneering vessels and was sent back to the Caribbean to destroy the Dutch base of Curaçao. Instead of going to Curaçao and doing what he had been ordered to do, he decided to return to Tobago and finish what he had begun. That sort of tells you what he thought about the victory. This time he had more than 3,500 infantry, supported by mortars and artillery which he landed, and he intended to carry out an entirely land-based attack. The fort was still not completed. The Dutch had even fewer men by this stage from sickness. But what really gave the victory to the French was a very lucky shot. The third bomb fired by the mortars hit the gunpowder supply of the Dutch, blew up the area and blew up the entire officers' quarters, killing 250 men plus 16 officers, including Jacob Banks. That put the resistance of the Dutch out. So nominally, the island became French. In truth, no one occupied the island until after the Seven Years' War, when it became a British colony 
after the Treaty of 1763. Meanwhile, the island mostly was occupied by Carib Indians, buccaneers, and filibustiers. It also has the reputably is the island that inspired Robinson Crusoe's uh, island. Fast forward to the 1690s. Construction began on expanding the port facilities in Scarborough Harbor. In the process of uh, this expansion, however, material culture started emerging from the bottom of the sea, including these three cannon, which are displayed now on the waterfront in Scarborough Harbor. One, the bronze gun, a 24-pounder, bears the arms of Le Vicomte Vandois, which was the Minister of the Navy for King Louis XIV in the 1660s and early 70s. And in fact, the gun was cast in 69, if I remember correctly. The other two guns are smaller 12-pounders and they are of iron, cast iron. To us, particular interest was this gun over here, because on this trunnion, the support of the gun on which it is based in its carriage, you see this stamp or this mark of the foundry in which it was produced. This mark belongs to the foundry of Ocker Stickerbrook. Ocker Stickerbrook is a Swedish foundry that was established specifically for the purpose of manufacturing cannon for export. Sweden had plentiful supplies of uh, iron and copper, incidentally. Ocker Stickerbrook are in the military business to the present day, though I do believe that uh, their offerings have changed since the time of this gun. They were selling artillery to pretty much everybody in Europe, from England through the Netherlands, uh, the different German principalities, the um, Iberian Peninsula, and almost certainly also to the French. Although the label on the monument says that the iron guns belong to, to, to Dutch ships and the bronze to French ships, we don't have any positive evidence to this effort. It is pure guesswork on somebody's part. It is possible, but it is no more than a guesswork. During that construction, subsequently to that project, in the later 16, uh, in the later 1990s, West Hall was engaged. An American surveyor and archaeologist was engaged to carry out a detailed cultural resource survey of the bay and to offer a report to the government. He did that part. He discovered a number of targets, some of which he dived on and confirmed to be shipwrecks. He believed that two of them were from this remnants of this battle and suspected that the rest of the ships must be somewhere there in the bay. Uh, initially, interest in studying this uh, cultural resource was started by Heritage Management Consulting, a Trinidad-based uh, heritage company, which engaged a group of British archaeologists. Some of them had worked previously for the Mary Rose Trust. That's why often popularly and incorrectly that project is called the Mary Rose Project. It was not. The trust had nothing to do with it. It is very hard to get participants in that project to talk about it at all. Be this as it may, there is only one preliminary report that survives on the internet by Westy McEwen that even remotely speaks of the work. In a moment, I will talk about what they have discovered and what we the project did not last longer than one season. They did not return. Westco considered this to be a tragedy because of the exceptional importance of the site. He contacted the Institute of Nautical Archaeology in Texas A&M. At the time, the person that he knew and contacted, Professor Kevin Christman, was engaged in an expedition in the Azores, so he couldn't take another project. He passed it on to Felipe Castro, who had no interest in Dutch seafaring. And that is how the portfolio eventually ended up in my lap. We obtained permits from the Texas, uh, I'm sorry, from uh, the Tobago House of Assembly, to which we express our gratitude. 
with the support of the American, especially the Dutch embassy in this project, to which, again, I express my deep and ongoing gratitude. Most of our operations were based on the, this catamaran known as the Blue Spartan, though among us we never, in front of the captain of course, we called it the Millennial Falcon. Why? Because just like that character from Star Wars, she never, ever, to my certain knowledge, worked properly. She never completely collapsed and abandoned us, but there always was something wrong with her, just like the original Millennial Falcon. What engages us, of course, in maritime archaeology is the glorious aspects, the, the truly wonderful diving in Caribbean crystal clear water with perfect visibility, as you see here at the bottom. And it is the glamour of nautical archaeology. For example, mixing concrete in high humidity and high temperature outside to prepare control posts for the documentation of the site. Joking aside, Let's look at the archaeological side. There were a couple of things that were of great scientific interest. First of all, assuming we relocated the Dutch wrecks, this would have been the largest collection of ships built approximately at the same time of approximately similar, if not outright identical uh, style of construction. And therefore, of great value, it would have uh, allowed us finally to generalize about shipbuilding in the 17th century. Archaeology is a science that loves repetition. It does not like exceptions to the rule, because it is very ill-equipped to explain exceptions. The second part that we wanted to see was studying the timbers can tell us a lot about climate at the time when the trees grew. And having such a large selection of warships with uh, such a large selection of timbers. As I mentioned earlier, the Netherlands did not have forests of their own. They imported their timbers. As a result of this, we would have had a beautiful selection of timbers that grew in different places around Europe. And that would have helped us begin to build a better picture of uh, 17th century climate, 16th and 17th century climate at the time. That was at least the idea. In 2012, with West Hall and a small team, we began the project. West Hall was able to immediately relocate what he once upon a time had called the Rec A, our Tier B1, right off the Coast Guard jetty over here. Tier B2 which once upon a time had been a huge ballast pile, well covered, protruding more than a meter above the bottom. That had been in the days before the new water jet ferries, fast uh, ferries had been introduced into service. Because this is the place where the ferries turn around in order to dock, this entire part of the bottom is scored down almost to the bedrock. I'll show you some images a little bit later. So tier B2 was practically impossible to relocate. It was very hard to relocate. The ballast pile is completely gone. A tier B, a location that we have closed uh, called tier B3, which means Tobago Rockley Bay site three, it proved to be only a single cannon. Yes, cannon that probably comes from the battle. It is seems to be a 17th century cast iron gun but it is on its own. There is no wreck associated with it. It may have been dredged into this place as a result of the construction, because all of this is landfill here, all of this is man-made. Maybe a result of the construction, maybe a result of a burning ship that shook a gun over there before drifting ashore, who knows. Here before eventually would prove to be another early 19th century vessel, it is fairly well preserved because it is outside the range of the ferries. For the rest of the sites, we will return in just a moment. Tier B1 was also the site that had been started in the year 2000 by the archaeological crew that I mentioned. They had reported that this was indeed a 17th century wreck. They had taken timber samples for dendrochronological analysis and also claimed that the artifact collection uh, also seemed to be 17th century. 
Unfortunately, although we know that about 130 items were found and recorded at the time, no one at present knows where that uh, collection of artifacts has gone. Neither do we, nor uh, does the Tobago House of Assembly, nor the Tobago Historical Trust. Unless something has changed since my last involvement in the island, the location of these artifacts is currently unknown. We relocated the site. The visibility there is just about zero. It is covered with very fine silt that even breathing underwater uh, creates a cloud that blacks out the entire uh, site. So we had to probe with iron bar across the length of the site and we did a few transactions that we recorded. And this way we were able to relocate the original excavated area of the site over here. Since to me at least the greatest interest was the ship construction aspect, we decided the following season 2013 to reopen the old trench for two reasons. First of all, to protect the site that has not been touched yet and prevent any damage happening to it until we determine whether this is the right period and the right type of wreck and whether it is of greater interest to excavate further. Second, of course, there was the issue of conservation of uh, any new artifacts in this area. We knew that there would be nothing found. We began uh, the project. We reached the timbers and we even relocated. Over here, you see the plastic labels attached by the expedition in the year 2000. But that was the only point in common that we had with the expedition uh, from 2000. We had only one day in which you could take any photographs of the site at all. We took dendrochronological samples to analyze to date and possibly source the timbers. And of course, we were able to document the construction of uh, the vessel that was visible in the area. Here is the site plan that we did. This is only about a uh, couple of meters length, the vessel, a little over it. We found four or five, seven frame stations, although the previous expedition had recorded only these four. Apparently, they had not realized that these are frames also, or anyway, it does not matter. We have the keel, we have the false keel under it, we have the dead wood, and we have the frames that were originally attached to the dead wood. Very early on, once we had uncovered this one, we started documenting, it became clear that this for sure cannot be a Dutch built ship and almost certainly is actually British or Brit British tradition built vessel of the 18th century, second half of the 18th century, if I'm to be any judge of it. Probably not later than the 70s of the 18th century because there is no trace of copper sheathing and by the late 1780s even merchant ships were beginning to be coppered on the outside. Furthermore, we found this four and a half fastener only between these two timbers which identified it as a mode or station frame and the rest of the timbers as filling frames. Normally in British practice every third or every fourth frame is fastened to each other, the others are not. But this is characteristic of uh, English and British shipbuilding. It is not a characteristic of 17th century Dutch building. The timber samples did not yield the date, unfortunately, but they lacked consistency between them, meaning that they were sourced from different places, implying trade. They also were coming from fast-grown oak, which is more typical for the northeastern coast of North America. So it is quite possible that this is really the remains of uh, American colonial vessels. The vessel, whatever the case may be, it definitely is not a 17th century wreck. Furthermore, what little we saw in the scar protruding were English style red bricks of the 18th century, not the yellow flat Dutch bricks of the 17th century. As to other artifacts that we found in the trench, they varied in uh, quality from plastic bags, uh, shopping bags, through chips bags, through plastic forks and plates that somehow had ended up in the trench. 
uh, plastic silverware, oh, and a bag from one of the local fast food chicken uh, places on the main street. Here is a close-up photograph. This is the corroded iron fastener that is holding the two timbers together that I showed you on the sideline a moment ago. At that stage, it was clear that we are not looking at one of the 17th century vessels, and therefore it is of little interest to us. There were a couple of uh, questions, however, that the report published on the Nautical Archaeology Society, cited by Wesley McEwen, rose. She speaks of artifacts there, but she does not list a single one of the artifacts, what type they were. Obviously, they have now disappeared, so we do not know what they were. She speaks of a number of samples, 10 samples that were taken for dating from the timbers. Uh, my colleague and friend, Professor Nigel Nailing, attempted to track, he spoke with every single dendrochronological laboratory in Europe that is likely to have handled this kind of material, and not one of them had any record of ever having dealt with samples from Tobago. So that raises the question, where were these samples sent? Were they sent? We found no evidence of samples being taken from the timbers. Furthermore, we have other indications. Uh, participants in that project sent me some photographs and a short video showing this gun, in fact, being raised from the site. But the archaeologists do not mention a cannon. And this is very clear, quite possibly a 17th century gun. So why would you not mention a gun? That would be a strong confirmation that this is one of the 17th century warships. No such confirmation was coming in the report. No mention of the gun was made. Subsequently, a local informer uh, by the name of Rambo told me that this gun was indeed raised from the site, but actually he moved it to the site on the orders of the heritage company that he was working from the site, and in reality did not belong to the wreck. I don't know the truth. All I know is that the location of the gun was unknown until October 2012, when Dr. Livas Guy Obiakor and myself by accident, uh, found it next to the workshops of the ferry folks left outside. Currently, the gun, well, we moved the gun into cover in 2014. It is located into the, what was supposed to become a conservation laboratory on the waterfront. At least it is protected from the elements and further destruction. It is a small gun, probably no more than a six-pounder, as the measurement of the bore suggests. It is cast iron. Here is a three-dimensional model that we have created of the gun. And it could have come from any of the ships. There are no indications. There are some cuttings on the bridge, but they are only telling us something about the weight. There is no identification number. There is uh, nothing to suggest where it was cast or for which navy it served. Once we determined that Tier B1 cannot and is not the right vessel for us, we immediately moved to continue our work on uh, Tier B2 to attempt to confirm that site. There is a gun line that is consistent with 17th century, but the bricks that you see in front of the gun have a stamp on them that dates to the 1830s and 40s. So this probably is actually a wreck from the, uh, from the 1844 hurricane. The gun itself is clearly not in its original position. First of all, it is lying upside down. But second of all, around the trunnions in this part, there is a steel cable wrapped around the gun. So somebody at some point attempted to lift it and probably take it. However, in this final battle, the gun won hands down, the cable broke, and the gun is still lying on the bottom, there in the path of the ferries. The bottom is uh, strewn with bottles. Most of these are 18th century, which confirms the later period of the wreck and the impossibility for it to be 17th century. 
As I mentioned, this lies immediately, well, actually it is right under this ferry at the moment as it is maneuvering to back down. The jets of the ferry are just cooling the bottom. In addition, the barge that brings sand and concrete there to Tobago periodically likes to drop its anchor and drag it along the bottom in the process of docking. And this is what you see. This is the result of this dragging here, this cooler. It is throwing up cultural material all over the place on the surface, from bottles through pottery, bone, and other material. These were recovered from that trench dug by the anchor. This is a 19th century Victorian style coffee pot. These are 18th century stoneware, English manufacture. These are 18th century uh, wine bottles and 18th century smoking pipes are emerging from that area. By 1814, by 19, uh, 2014, your pardon, we were aware that none of these sites were what we were looking for. So we organized a survey with uh, J.B. Pelletier, who directed the survey, my friend and colleague Jason Paternity participated, and we looked for the 17th century wrecks. Jumping the gun, I should point out that it appears that the majority of the wrecks are now lying under the modern uh, port facilities of Scarborough Harbor. One site, Tier D5, however, was confirmed to be a 17th century Dutch warship, and that is the only one that is uh, accessible and surviving at the moment, as far as we can tell. We dived on the site while J.B. Pelletier was working on getting the GPS to work properly and record uh, purely by chance. And the first thing that we started seeing on the bottom were these cannon around it. Later in 2014, we returned and we continued work in 2015 and 2016 on the same site. This is the line of guns that have been located. The interesting part really is here. What looked like a reef proved to be actually a concretion formed by the wreck. Here in this area, we discovered ballast stones. They are distinct from normal stones because they are always riverine. They are well-rounded. They are almost of uniform size because it is the easiest to stow inside the warship. In addition to them, in the same group, we discovered large, huge quantities of typical Dutch yellow ochre colored flat thin bricks. I measured significant, statistically significant sample of them and compared them to published records and found that they all agree with the standard is established in 1644 by uh, in the city of Leiden in the Netherlands. One archaeologist colleague actually expressed to me doubt that such a thing existed as Leiden standard. However, Nicholas Witsen, a burgomaster of Amsterdam, who wrote the earliest published treatise on Dutch shipbuilding, in his chapter on building the galley or the cooking arrangement on board the ship, he specifically says that you need such and such number of laden bricks to build the galley. So in the 17th century, at least, such a standard was known to exist. We opened a test trench to confirm the dating of the site and to see what survival we have. In the background here, you see the bricks that were raised to be measured. This is a typical 17th century Dutch galley. This is coming from a model of an East Indiaman, however, but the section is good because it is showing what Witsen described. On the deck, you lay a layer of sand, then a layer of uh, metal, usually copper sheathing. On top of the copper, you build up this brick structure where an, on open fire, uh, the meals for the crew were cooked. So we have no doubt that we are in the location of the galley for the simple reason that this was the only place where we found bricks through the entire area. This is a contemporary 17th century Dutch warship model that unfortunately was destroyed during World War II. It is known as the Holland Solar model. And over here you see the location of the galley. This is the chimney that expanded the smoke out above the upper deck. The galley itself is built on a platform that hung into the hold of the vessel and it's built of bricks. Why is this? Uh, why am I showing you this? Because here you see one gun port, 
two of the upper deck, and finally third. This indicates three different calibers. The only place where you're going to see three different calibers together is either the forecastle or the stern quarter on the deck. And in the area around this, around the galley, we found an 18 pounder, something that is very likely either an eight or a 12 pounder, it's hard to tell, and a gun that is probably a four pounder. Thus, we knew our location. We were right in this area of whatever ship sank in that place. Here is Cannon 5, which is an 18 pounder. Here you see the smaller three pounder that rolled from the forecastle of the vessel. And in this trench over here are the bricks from the galley. And the middle range gun is just beyond that model. It was not visible. We opened the trench, we drew the normal profile. This is what you see here. Veronica Morris is drawing a profile through the section to determine the layering. Over here, you see one of the guns. We established a network of direct survey measurements to help us uh, map the site. And we opened the trench to confirm the, 18th, the supposed 18th century dating of the site. We used water dredges for this purpose. You never know what will emerge from an archaeological site. For example, turtles tended to come and visit us periodically to see what is this horrible noise that we are making. Among the interesting things that opened up in the galley was, of course, smoking pipes. But they are fairly frequent occurrence. Luckily, they are diagnostic artifacts. And this is comfortably dated in the second half of the 17th century. The interesting, surprising find was this fork. It was discovered by Professor Nailing, incidentally, whom you see over here. The first thing that confirmed the 17th century was this small jug. It is known as Rhenish stoneware, or green glazed stoneware, or salt glazed stoneware. All of these names apply to the same type of vessel. It is ubiquitous and it is firmly dated into the 17th century from numerous, numerous parallels around the world, both on dry land and also uh, from underwater sites. The continuation of the exercise, of course, yielded us something in the vicinity of 72 pipes, uh, all of them broken with fragments and the stems from even more uh, pieces. The good thing, as I said, is smoking pipes are diagnostic. Their extensive publications, their chronology is well studied. Most of the manufacturing centers are well known. So it is easy to date them and this confirms our 17th century uh, date for the site. Another interesting jug that emerged in this area of the site over here is also a typical product of the late 16th through the 17th century. They are long-lived, they are known as Siegburg Pullen, and of course they usually contained liquids, most often they contained beer. There should be also a pewter cap for it, but that had not survived underwater. Uh, don't let the date 1589 mislead you. This is probably 17th century uh, manufacturing, but the date refers to when the mold in which this jug is made was produced. This is both vessels after we uh, did the preliminary conservation and cleaned them. So glazed because the vessel, after uh, you apply the glaze, you cover it with uh, rock salt before firing it. And this is what gives this uh, characteristic spotted green coloring. The pool is known as the biblical generals, though I don't know why Alexander the Great qualifies as Biblical General. The other one is Joshua over here. And the third one on the medallions is actually David. This is a three-dimensional model that we created of the Pule. Although it has somewhat distorted the shape, in reality it is much rounder than it looks over here. This is a process of cleaning and preliminary conservation. All the material has been reburied on the site, and our friend and colleague Derek Chung uh, was part of the crew that actually reburied the site and covered. So, you know, the location of the artifacts. I spoke of the uh, smoking pipes. 
They vary. They're all, uh, with two exceptions, they are Dutch manufacturing. Most come from the Dutch city of Huda with this dot decoration. And over here also, um, also. This one bears, and this one bear the arms of the Spanish Habsburgs, for reason best known to the Dutch, but they are still Dutch manufactured. Typical 17th century characteristics of the pipe. The bow itself looks like a barrel. It is biconical, as you can see, and the angle between the stem and the pipe is obtuse. This is the typical English uh, manufacturing. It is known as Sir Walter Raleigh, pipe, although it has nothing to do with Raleigh himself, but it is the one pipe that has anthropomorphic features, essentially a human face facing the smoker. Here you see the Habsburg arms, the typical so-called Tudor rose, though it has nothing to do with the Tudors or with the rose for that matter, but that's what English scholars have called them, despite the fact that it is very definitely a Dutch manufactured pipe. Some of the stems are heavily decorated, as on this pipe. On other pipes, we have found fleur de lis decorations. They also were popular. They all date to the 17th century. But the interesting part in all this is the collection of forks, because they are, I wouldn't say unique. There are other sites from the 17th century that have forks. But in the 17th century, the fork was still very much an innovation. In fact, there is a memoir uh, for the times of Louis XIV uh, France, who said that the king himself was deeply upset because the tutor of uh, the Dauphin, that is to say the heir to the throne, was teaching the Dauphin using forks, these newfangled things, the forks, to eat, instead of teaching him proper polite manners to eat with his hands. Right. Similar uh, forks and spoons with this characteristic thrifid uh, end of the fork have been found also from close context in uh, Port Royal, which, as you know, was destroyed by an earthquake in 1690s, and therefore is undoubtedly 17th century. Similar spoons and forks have been discovered on other uh, sites. The earliest forks are from the 16th century. So to us, this was another confirmation of the date. It is interesting to see these high and things that you would expect the officers to be using. It is interesting to see them found in the galley, which was the prerogative of the sailors and the common crew. This may very well be a result of loot. This may be loot that was gathered during the raiding of the French colonies. This spoon probably was of English manufacture based on a stamp that was found. Here is a parallel in the Albert and Victorian Albert Museum in uh, London that has exactly the same trifid uh, decoration. This one is obviously higher, and this one is silver, while the one, uh, I'm sorry, cast pewter, and so are the ones that we found in Tobago. This one is actually bronze rather than pewter, but it has the same stamp on it that is typical of English manufacturing in the first half of the 17th century. A student of mine is currently uh, investigating this subject further. Among the artifacts found, are this is the fire part of a firing mechanism of either a pistol or a musket, probably a pistol. We found a group of total of 11 musket and pistol bows. The smaller caliber, as you can see, are pistol bows. The larger ones are from muskets. After all, it was a warship. None of these shot have been used during the battle. Here is a collection of some of the pottery. These two you have already seen. This is a fragment of the larger kind of French stoneware. Here is part of the medallion. They are also diagnostic. There is a very good chronology of their uh, description from European and other sites. So it confirms second half of the 17th century date. This is a medicine jar that probably would have contained once upon a time some sort of uh, paste used you know, for medicinal purposes, but similar jars are also used to hold uh, spices and herbs. It is probably Dutch manufacture, it is Maholica, probably Dutch, because it is found regularly on Dutch uh, sites. Unfortunately, it is also found on English sites, so it is harder to tell exactly where they were manufactured. 
This was a flyover of the site as created by a Texas A&M graduate, Kota Yumafune, and he's giving you a brief overview of what we saw. Here on the left, you can see how the camera is moving across the trenches that we opened. These semi-round things that you see on top of it is the concreted ballast of the wreck. The one disappointment from my point of view is that there is absolutely no hull preservation, no timbers whatsoever have survived. Yes, as you can see, we can tell quite a lot about the site from what we have seen, but ship structure, ship reconstruction and climate reconstruction is certainly not possible from this site. TRB-5 is located right over here. TRB-6 proved to be an anchor that I'll show you in just a moment. We cannot absolutely prove that the anchor belonged to TRB-5, but it is very likely because that is the wreck that has fallen in this area. It is consistent also with 17th century uh, date. Here is the anchor. Documenting was a challenge because uh, Moray EO uh, has made its home next to it. And the first time that I was observing the anchor and came face to face with the Morel E, with the EO, I have to say that I beat the world record for speed underwater. I don't think that any shark, any whale could have possibly kept up with me. I was so quick to evacuate the area. Subsequently, we excavated the buried part of the anchor to confirm its 17th century. What are the characteristics of the earlier period anchors? And they cannot be dated closer than about 100, 150 years, uh, roughly. The shank of the anchor is longer in proportion than is the spread of the arms of the anchor. The arms here, the crown of the anchor comes to a sharp angle rather than being rounded. The anchor arms are not quite straight, but very nearly so. All of these are characteristics of early style of anchors. Uh, date that is quite consistent with the rest of the site. And this is the end, the vertical end of the site. And over here you still see concreted ballast stones. So this is not really a natural reef. It is a reef that was formed by the wreck. Two of the guns that are in company with each other. The one is an 18, undoubted 18 pounder. The other one is either eight or 12 pounder, probably an eight pounder, which is what you would expect from the side. And over here is again, the three, uh, the small three pounder. This confirms that we are talking about a two decker that carried as heavy artillery, 18 pounders. And this really is our sole clue at the moment to identifying the vessel or attempting to identify it. it. The wreck is in this area over here. If we were to take this uh, right over here. We know of only three Dutch ships that could possibly have carried 18 pounders. For the 44 gun uh, Zealand, I cannot tell because there are no records. But the 44 guns, she could have carried some 18 pounders at least. Unfortunately, or fortunately, she did not sink in the battle. She was run aground, but subsequently she was refloated. Over here is Beshermer. Beshermer, for a fact, was armed with 18 pounders, but she was not lost in the battle either. Again, she was run aground, but subsequently was refloated, and the French captured her during the second battle of Tobago, and subsequently lost her on the Alves uh, reef of Colombia. Therefore, Neither of these ships could be tier B5. The only other ship among the Dutch vessels that could carry 18 pounders was Helste Kroeningen. She also is the only ship of the big units that was lost in the battle and sank. This is how the ships would have approached with the dominant currents and winds. The fight between Glorious and Hells de Kroeningen began somewhere over here. 
Glorios is believed to have ended up right over here and the wreck probably was completely destroyed during the construction of the long jetty. Material and French cannon emerged, including the cannon I showed you, emerged from this area at the time of the construction. We only once were able to dive in this area because of the ferry traffic. And there are timbers, likely ship timbers, protruding from the old jetty, from under the old jetty. And there are some timbers in this area over here, which may very well be part of uh, Glorious. Kroenigen would have drifted directly in this direction, following the currents, following the winds in the time. And that is, of course, exactly where we are finding tier B5. Here we find the anchor right next to each other. And this is the Dutch line over here. Basically, I can prove that tier B5 cannot be any of the other vessels. The only ship that I cannot prove she is not is the Haus de Kroeningen. And following the principles of Sherlock Holmes, when you exclude all the impossible things, however unlikely what is left is the likely correct answer. That is why we suggest that we have found the wreck of House de Kroeningen. This is a portrait of Beschermen. They are all drawn in the 17th century by the great Dutch marine artist, the father and son Willem van de Velde. These four are by the father, or the Ode. Willem van de Velde, they, these are artists that are renowned for the absolute accuracy of their drawings. If they show a boat on the vessel, you know that the boat was there, indeed. That's why I'm including them. So, we propose that we have found the wreck of Hels de Kroeningen. She was built in 1653 for Genoa, but the States General took her over because they needed larger ships for the States Navy, which was engaged in the final acts of the war with the First Anglo-Dutch War. Uh, the ship is named after the castle of Kroeningen, which survived until the 1690s, and in 1697 98 was torn down for a new manor to be constructed in that area. But this is the drawing of the original. This is in the French archives, this drawing. This one is at the National Maritime Museum in England. But both are showing the same ship from two separate views. The ship has greater uh, implication than and importance even than the Battle of Tobago itself. Namely, in 1653, she carried the flag of the national hero of the Netherlands, Admiral Michiel de Gauta, whom you see over here. If this indeed is Hels de Kroeningen, this is the only material evidence left from the great Admiral, the only ship, the remains of which has been found that carried his flag ever. So, of course, it is of great cultural significance. Throughout the project, we have had the support of the Tobago House of Assembly and the Tourism Department in particular. To them, I express my deep gratitude. We had the financial support of the Institute of Nautical Archaeology and my friend Jason Paterniti, to whom I thank for that. We have had the unwavering support of the Dutch Embassy and encouragement. Here you see Her Excellency Minyur Alam, who was at the time the Dutch Ambassador. On the left is the then Governor of Curaçao, and this gentleman is the second in command of the Dutch Embassy. They were a mountain of support and encouragement throughout the project, and I'm deeply obliged to them. Dr. Guy Leavis Obiakor, no words of mine can ever express the gratitude that we owe to Dr. Uh, Guy Leavis. Guy Obiakor, without her, nothing could have happened. This project would not have been possible with her enthusiasm, with her encouragement, with her efforts in public outreach. And we are very deeply grateful. She is a dear friend to the present day. And finally, I would like to thank the Tobago Hall, uh, Historical Trust, and particularly Mr. Dumas and his colleagues. They also sent uh, Doc, uh, Mr. Derek Chung to work with us, and I'm very grateful for his contribution to the work on the project. 
It was a real pleasure and privilege, one of the best divers that I have ever worked with. Uh, the Tobago Historical uh, Trust were a great support, and especially Mr. Dumas himself. And with this, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention, and I hope one day again to see you on the site of TRP5. Wow, such a fantastic presentation, Dr. Bashbara. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I don't know if you would like to say a couple of words before we get into the, um, to the question and answer segment. Maybe there's something you forgot or something you want to say, some burning issue that you want to, you know, talk about. Somebody wrote to you. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions in the background while the lecture was going on. We have I've been corresponding with some of the participants. And first of all, thank you ever so much for organizing this to all the organizers. Thank you very much for everybody who gave so much of their time to listen to um, me rambling on. As one right honorable uh, participant in this seminar pointed out, it does sound like a lecture. My apologies. This is professional deformation on my part. <laughs> I'm a university professor. I speak like a university professor. My apologies for this. Uh, this was a unique and very interesting project on many, many different levels. The material culture that we have found uh, is, I wouldn't say unique, but in this context, it is. One of the big questions, for example, that the archaeological community came up with was the presence of the forks. It is such a common everyday utility for us. We all um, use them all the time. There is nothing significant from our point of view. But in the 17th century, this was very much something truly new, almost bizarre. I mentioned earlier that King Louis XIV himself considered it to be bad manners to use fork when you can use your fingers when you're properly trained to do it, etc. But this is an interesting collection. The smoking pipes from the site are a very interesting collection if they are displayed. And the whole cultural heritage of the island of Tobago is... Uh, incredible from the Carib Islands periodic, not long ago, actually, Mr. Chung shared with me a photograph of a very well preserved waterlogged canoe that has emerged. Uh, all this material really needs to be in a museum. We have deposited on the bottom because this is the only way that it can be protected and uh, saved for the future. But it belongs into a museum. Uh, Yes, such a museum it would be one of the unique characteristics of Tobago in comparison with most other islands in the Caribbean. Uh, Tobago is beautiful. I'm very much ashamed, and please do not repeat it in front of anyone else. I would deny it, but I'm very much ashamed to admit that I actually have not learned to know Tobago nearly as well as I should have. I have seen to, uh, Scarborough Harbor, I know the waterfront of Scarborough Harbor in detail. I know the bottom probably better than most people, but I have never been to the other side of the island. I've never been into the jungle. I've never been into even Bloody Bay. There is so much beauty in this island and the cultural heritage and the cultural richness of the island. I mean, imagine how many different cultures, how many different civilizations have left their mark on the island in one way or another. As uh, the Right Honorable Secretary mentioned in his opening remarks, we don't have to like the history, but we have to know it. Or to paraphrase roughly what uh, Winston Churchill said, if we do not know history, we are bound to relive it. So in a way, the more we dislike some elements of history, the more we should strive to bring it forth, to keep it in the public mind, to educate ourselves and educate others. Well, this was one of the aspects of our project. And that was the part that uh, lay really close to Dr. Levis, Gaia, of course, heart, the public outreach. 
the model of the gun that I showed, uh, school children from Tobago were invited to create such models themselves. We told them, we showed them how photogrammetry worked. My friend and colleague, Dr. Ingalls, was particularly good uh, in this outreach program. And I think that this is something that can and probably should be continued. I I see that there is a flood of questions on the side, but I can't. Yes. They're moving way too fast for me to yes. address. So I'm I'm going to um pick out some of the questions. I must say that there are questions that maybe you don't know the answer to in terms of our policy, um, national policy in Tobago and so forth. But I will still um ask you some of them so we can probably get your suggestions on some of those matters. Okay. So let's Absolutely. begin. Let's begin. Um, the first question asks, what recommendations, if any, can be offered for onshore developmental projects in the Bay Area to minimize or mitigate against the negative impacts on the study area and to enhance safe opportunities for dive tourism and education? This is an excellent question. Well, Everything boils down to a political will to do something and second, of course, be uh, funding to do it mm. in the direct path of the ferries. There is not a whole lot that we can actually the only thing that we can do is complete archaeological survey and excavation of the area in which the ferries maneuver because there is no way that we can stop the ferry traffic. Obviously, this is part of the development. This is the present day. Uh, the past should not destroy the present. So either you shift the entire port and the ferries to a different location. And when I was last in Tobago, I remember that uh, one of the politicians was considering this as an option at the time. But is it a practical option? I don't know the resources of Tobago. I suspect that it is not practical. Then the only thing left is to excavate, recover the cultural material in the path of the ferries, establish, continue the conservation laboratory that was begun there, hire a professional conservator who can treat this material. I'm not a conservator myself. I have taken cons conservation courses, of course, as is the standard for Texas a and uh, maritime archaeology professionals. But the best part that I have learned from uh, my courses is hire a professional and don't touch yourself. And that, I suppose, is a valuable lesson to learn. So yeah. that is the part for this area. The area where the possible wreck of Hills de Kroeningen, and I beg the pardon of our Dutch uh, colleagues and friends for my horrible mispronunciation of the vessel's name, that is a little bit less uh, directly impacted by the development unless the government decides to expand the port in that direction. As I said, many of the French and Dutch wrecks from that battle, I believe are currently under the port facilities. There was only one time when we were able to dive, one Sunday when for some reason ferries were not running, despite the fact that the weather was very calm inside the port. Uh, for once, for once, there was crystal clear visibility. We were able to find undoubtedly ship timbers protruding from the old jetty and also under the second set of dolphins from the sea towards shore on uh, the new jetty, the long one. Both types of timbers I cannot positively date without taking samples. They were badly eaten up by Teredona Valis, of course. They were clearly damaged, but in their dimensions and overall shape, uh, they were consistent with uh, 17th century or wood ship timbers in the first place. And for one of the planks that was protruding from uh, the old jetty, I also found characteristics of Dutch uh, shipbuilding. It is called a spiker pennon. It is uh, essentially a small dowel that is driven into the plank once temporary nails that held the construction together while the ship was being built are uh, removed. And I saw such spiker pennon. Uh, on that line. So I strongly suspect that the, these were the timbers of one of the 17th century wrecks. Obviously, Sfera Mundi and relocation of that would have strong 
um, symbolic importance for the population of Tobago because this is where 450 people were aboard and most of them died. Significant portion, although some were uh, European uh, women and children, the majority were actually people of African origin. Most of them incidentally captured from the French colonies and moved to Tobago. But that is speaking to the African uh, cultural inheritance of Tobago. So that is a site that, assuming we can locate, and I believe that it is actually under the current coastal uh, waterfront street, it is somewhere there. Comparing the old uh, chart of the port with the new, uh, overlaying the two and seeing where the uh, ships would have drifted, I believe that is the case. But that is a place that should be treated as, um, as a grave as a monument to the people who die. And yes, I know that the local waterfront population also consider the bay to be unlucky. And I received many warnings that I'm likely to die if I die, if I continue diving in the area because other people have died before that. So far, I'm still alive. But uh, at any rate, this is essentially a, one huge graveyard. There are ways to do it, but they require some funding, not nearly as much as one would think, and certainly interest and political desire to do it. Conservation, excavation, and uh, recovery of the artifacts that are getting in the school area of the ferries and uh, sand barge that arise periodically, at least was arriving up to 2016, the last time I was diving in the area. I don't know if it is continuing, but I see no reason why it would stop. But as part of their maneuver, they drop their anchor farther out as they maneuver the barge into position, and the anchor drags through the bottom. It is standard seamanship. There is absolutely no blame or criticism uh, attached to my statement. It is something that is a byproduct of normal seamanship, the same way that the ferries, they, they can't turn anywhere else. They have to turn in this location. And the only thing we can do is to deal with the reality of the situation. We can't change it. So the only way to do it is to find remedial actions. And yes, this, is, uh, this does not require only underwater maritime archaeologists or specialists. This requires people on dry land. The documentation, you uh, actually will remember how much of the work is actually carried out on dry land. Diving is less than 10% of the archaeology. Quite. That's for sure. There were a lot of days we were in the um, facility on dry land, just doing work without doing anything in the water. Right. So there are many other questions. So um, I'd like to continue. Uh, you may have hit a little bit on this in your last um, answer, but maybe you could be more specific. What three realistic actions can be taken to kickstart archaeological conservation in Tobago? Well, first and foremost, hiring a conservator. Second is completing the conservation facility that was being built in the port. Uh, that building is well adapted to be converted into a full-scale conservation laboratory. It has good concrete flooring. It has running water into it. It is open, uh, place where we can position uh, water tanks. One of the key features of maritime material is that it has to be kept wet all the time. It has to be kept and gradually uh, desalination needs to take place. This means that Gradually, the salinity of the water needs to be dropped to the point where we are dealing with distilled water so that all the salts from the artifacts can be leached. This is a long-term project. This does not happen overnight. Uh, but that is of vital importance because otherwise, especially in the Caribbean climate, when in the high heat, what is likely to happen is for the salts to crystallize as the artifact is drying out, and to crack and destroy the surface. This is why desalination is of vital importance. This is something that does not require much money. It can start easily. Uh, for the early stages, even rainwater can be used. So the wet season is a perfect time to do this. Hiring a conservator, completing the conservation laboratory, developing a plan 
of funding and uh, prioritization of the material culture. These are the three suggestions that I have. Years okay. ago, we were in the process of hiring, a, or rather Tobago was in the process of hiring a conservator, I clearly remember. Uh, this is nine and two. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Oh, no, you go ahead. Somebody was just um, off me, off me. You can go ahead. Ah, okay, sorry. Uh, Tobago was in the process of hiring a conservator. We even went through interviews. Dr. Uh, Guy Obiakor would remember this uh, with representative also of, I believe it was the tourist division. And uh, it was quite promising situation, but then uh, something happened. The woman never uh, received confirmation of her hiring and had to accept another position in Norway. If there is interest, I'm sure that another found. conservator can be found. found. It is just a question of, uh, well, basically political will. Understood, understood. Um, okay, from there, we have a question about the battle itself. Um, someone asks about the, the land portion of the battle. He asks, what usually became of the soldiers who did make landfall, but their side lost in the battle? For instance, on the first fight for Tobago, what happened yes, to the I... French soldiers who were on land fighting as their side sailed away? <laughs> These were blessed times when the word of a person actually did mean something and a promise. The standard operating procedure for European armies and navies at the time was that uh, any prisoners of war, anyone who surrendered was captured, would be exchanged. And usually they would be sent uh, by cartel, so-called cartel, which means under flag of truce, the vessel would repatriate the captured soldiers or sailors, as the case may be, though they would promise not to serve against you until they are properly exchanged with people of the same rank. In the case of the common seamen and soldiers, that usually was not strictly held, but uh, in the case of officers, it was a matter of honor. And interestingly, people actually kept to that agreement. We have positive evidence that even in dire straits, uh, people did not serve to help their own side until they were properly exchanged. In the case of the Battle of Tobago specifically, the French were able to withdraw all their forces. The Dutch were not interested in keeping any of them on the island, quite on the contrary. They were happy to get rid of them, partially because the Inconvenience of having lots of prisoners of war is that you have to feed them. And in those days, you couldn't make them work. You had to house them, you had to feed them, you had to treat them with respect, among everything else, because you don't know whether the fortune of war will not change and tomorrow you won't be in their place. So that is what happened to prisoners of war. But in the case of Tobago, they withdrew their entire force. The surviving force. Right. Um, as I said, that there, there are a lot of questions in the chat that deal with um, policy, and I'm not sure if it's um, in the right frame to ask you those policy policy questions specifically aimed at um, our national leadership. So we will go ahead. Uh, I have a question here. Give me one second. Given well, policy, the, I can only speak as uh, an expert from mm -hmm. outside. I cannot obviously speak uh, about national policy and how uh, things in the island, mm -hmm. because that is this. I'm a foreigner. I'm very friendly. Right. I love Tobago. I wish the best to Tobago and its people, but uh, it's not for a foreigner to tell an independent national government what to do. If they ask me for my advice, of course, and I'll direct yes. them to the right people. But uh, other than that, I can only express my personal opinion and expertise. Of course. But let's so. try. <laughs> um, given, you no, know, we'll go to this one. 
Given the strategic location of Tobago as a transshipment point, rest and depot, with wide and deep bays for hiding, it's reported that British, French, Dutch privateers at different times would have launched attacks on Spanish ships loaded with bullion bound for Spain on their return journey from South America. What is the likelihood of bullion being buried around the coastal waters of Tobago? <laughs> I'm afraid not very likely. Mm. The reason behind it is, yes, absolutely, we all hear about the Spanish galleons and we all hear about the great privateers and buccaneers and flibustiers who constantly capture these galleons. Unfortunately, that is a pure legend. The truth of the matter is that the Spanish administration, contrary to what the English tend to talk about them, were extremely effective and efficient. The truth of the matter is that the Spanish convoy system worked to perfection. The only ones that have ever managed successfully to intercept and destroy an entire Spanish convoy were the Dutch, specifically Pitt Hain in uh, 1628 is the only person who ever managed to capture an entire convoy. The Spanish admiral lost his head for this. That's a different point, story. So although there are no doubts that uh, buccaneers captured Spanish towns, uh, acquired great booty and subsequently spent it all and wasted in the best traditions of seamen, the truth of the matter is that the odds, the likelihood of any great Spanish treasures being hidden in the waters of Tobago are next to non-existent. Most of the people that used Tobago were small time privateers. They would have attacked smaller ships that were carrying just normal trade rather than the bullion. The bullion ships were way too well protected for this. They required the naval action. Okay, thank you so much. Um, you know, I'm sure everybody is probably thinking maybe that would have been the case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we're getting on to, to 12 o'clock here local time. So I think that this would be the last question. Any other questions that anybody else have for um, Dr. Wacharoff, you can probably send them an email. Um, I'd ask Karun, could you put your email address in the chat so everybody could, could get it? So they can probably send you. I'm um, typing it at the moment, yes. Yeah. Okay. So the final question, the final question is what are the three most appropriate international funding agencies for Tobago or Trinidad slash Trinidad archaeology. Um, you could speak about you could speak in your um, expertise of nautical archaeology. Where should we uh, who should we approach for probably funding in this in things like this in this issue? Well, that is actually an excellent question because it always is a question of uh, funding every archaeological work. It depends. In my case, the majority of my funding for the different projects that I have done over the years in different places, uh, the majority of the funding has been private, coming from private individuals or private trusts. For example, the Black Sea Map project was uh, funded by a British private trust uh, belonging to a in wealthy individual. In that case, we didn't apply. He was interested in uh, funding the research and essentially he found the scientists. Other, within national governments, any and all funds uh, towards development, cultural exchange, they are the appropriate agencies. In the case of the remnants of the Tobago battle, um, Obviously, I cannot speak for the Dutch state, but uh, the material that we have so far discovered is undoubtedly a Dutch cultural heritage. So since it's strict to by admiralty law, it really belongs to the Netherlands because it was a naval vessel. It was not a privately owned ship. And uh, state countries retain the rights over their national vessels uh, unless they specifically relinquish these rights. Otherwise, um, I 
I probably would be looking in the sphere of uh, cultural exchanges, cultural heritage foundations, uh, some of the bigger foundations, that would be my suggestion. Okay. And thank Sorry. you ever so much for all the very, very kind <laughs> remarks that uh, I'm doing my best to read through them as I'm speaking, and I'm not doing a particularly good job at it, but <laughs> thank you so much for uh, all participants. I see a question, sorry for the language, but would providers of geophysical oceanographic surveys be helpful? Yes, they would, of course. Uh, much of uh, the initial stage of the work, this is exactly what J.B. Pelletier was doing. Mr. Pelletier is a geophysicist who deals with archeological material and specifically cultural heritage, but he is a geophysicist. In the case of Trinidad and Tobago, I probably would start shaking the oil companies and the gas companies. They are sitting on bullions. If, you, if you're looking for the Spanish treasure galleons, that's where they are. Shake their, their pockets until the coins start rolling out. No, I'm joking, of course, and I'm being rude to them. But uh, the point is that very frequently, the major oil and gas companies, as part of their outreach, community outreach and outreach policy, are willing to help establish uh, projects and uh, agencies that have significant social impact. And at any rate, we're not losing anything by attempting to contact them. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Bachra for this fantastic presentation. Um, I thank all the participants for their questions. So I'll hand it over to Dr. Guy now to um, end the proceedings today. Thank you very much to everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kurum, and it's a pleasure to see you again. The pleasure is all mine. Um, now I would like to introduce the chairperson of the Trinidad and Tobago National Trust, Miss Margaret McDowell, to give a vote of thanks. Well, thank you, thank you everyone. This has been absolutely the best start to this wonderful lecture series. I want to start with you, um, Dr. Guy Obika. Um, you've been uh, an absolute source of inspiration from the first day I got a WhatsApp call from you. And I'm um, just looking forward to the whole 10 weeks of interaction and then beyond, because I believe this is the start of something that's going to be really great again. Uh, Professor, Dr. Prune Batshava, I have to get your name right, Batshvarov, is that right this time? Perfectly so, yes, thank you. Right, thank you again. I mean, this is, you know, what, what amazed me was all the little attention to detail, you know, all these little things that you just said by the way that, that was so fascinating. You know, I was looking at things like the forks and the and the um, Leiden um, bricks and so on. You know, we have a lot of relationship with Leiden. So every time we hear the word, we say, oh, something else from Leiden. So thank you so much. It's been really, really great. And I really want to thank His Excellency, um, the ambassador for the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Trinidad and Tobago, because you've really jumped at it as soon as Dr. Guy, I call, I call you Dr. Guy, you know that. As soon as you approach together, somehow the magic started and um, we've been able to get this going. The National Trust of Trinidad and Tobago is very, very happy to start this with you. You know, the heritage, we are discovering more and more how fascinating our heritage is, both the natural heritage, the built heritage, and now the marine heritage. And, um, and we really have so much of us just sitting on. And so we really believe that these lectures will help to reinterest the um, the rest of our citizens in this whole area and you know what we are actually sitting on something like port royal in jamaica for instance who have been doing a lot of lot of work in theirs and we have something just as fascinating right here in tobago so we are really looking forward to continuing these lectures for all of you who have been on, remember that um, if some of you have not been able to come at this time, once you're registered, we can give you the, the proceedings so you can listen. And anybody here who wants to just listen again and catch something, 
please, we are going to have the, um, the recording available to all of you. And you can tell all your friends, if you can't watch it at this time, still register so that you can do. And I do know that we had close to 200 people registered. And so the others are in fact going to listen afterwards and that can continue. So the National Trust is absolutely very, very pleased to be involved with this, along with our tourism and heritage and history partners in Tobago. Tobago has the most amazing group of, of personalities who have been working night, well, certainly almost every weekend, um, pandemic or no pandemic, curfew or no curfew to discover things. And we're really very glad to be working with them. And I've been looking at some of the participants, Kevin Kelly is on, I'm seeing you, thank you. We, we have all these wonderful people. I'm sure I saw, oh yes, Dr. Terence Southers is here and many others who are our friends from all over the world who are really very, very interested. And we know we can call on all of you to help us with this most fascinating exercise that we have now done. We have, as you say, fall in November, uh, I think it's four in December or three in December and then the rest in January. So we're here for the, the long haul. And at the end of the time, we should be able to really think what we're going to do next. I know next week is Dr. Uh, Pemberton, Rita Pemberton, who's going to talk a little bit about the colonial presence of the Dutch in the 17th century. That's going to be great as well as uh, all of the others. So. Thank you all. Have a great evening for, for you in Holland. A great rest of the day for us in this part of the world. And see you next week, Friday. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for the kind words, Ms. Mugawa. Thank you. OK. Um, Dr. Guy, would you like to say something else before we go? You're on mute. <laughs> okay. I just want to say thank you very much to the National Trust for partnering with us. Also, the again, the Kingdom of the Netherlands, the Philipsburg Jubilee Library, the Director of the Ministry of Culture in the Netherlands, uh, the Maritime Museum of Curaçao, the Mayor and the administration of the city of Blissinger. Uh, the administrations from Seba, Stacia, Curaçao. Uh, we are also very happy that they have been very supportive of this project. Uh, next week, as Ms. McDowell said, we would have our own Tobagonian, Dr. Rita Pemberton. We have a lot of other professors, including Professor Nigel Nailing. He is a dendrochronologist who came to Tobago to work on the timbers. And he also did some work on the tree at Runnymede, the large trees, the silk cotton trees, because that's part of his discipline. So he did some work on that for us. So again, to all the participants in the Caribbean, in the United States, in Europe, the Netherlands, I say thank you and see you next week, Friday at 10 a.m. Thank you and have a lovely weekend. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Aviakur, for organizing all this. And thank you for the invitation to participate and to talk. It was, as always, an honor and a pleasure. And a little bit sentimental warmth came into me remembering our wonderful times working in Tobago. Hopefully one day we can continue. Thank you.